This podcast is sponsored by Galecki Search Associates. Better recruiters, better results. In McKinsey's Future of Work study, they cite finance and insurance best suited for remote work, estimating that as much as 76% of time can be spent working from home without any loss to productivity. That's only one day in the office a week. So companies should be thinking about how to create a long-term experience that incorporates work from home flexibility, access to tools employees need at home, and this is important, build camaraderie in a digital or hybrid environment so that people feel they can advance in the company and stay long-term. All this seems to align with what we are hearing from candidates. They want the flexibility and benefits as well as the ability to progress in their careers without the commute. And now that talent has had a taste of freedom, their expectations for what they deserve and demand has changed. We're at an inflection point. The time is now to transform your culture into one that can support remote workers or you will lose the war on talent. And we're back. Hello, everyone. This is the Yellow Book Road podcast. This is the podcast where we try to bring insights and wisdom and just kernels and nuggets and just incredible amounts of useful information to the insurance industry. And so I'm ecstatic today because we're going to talk about auto insurance. We're going to talk about telematics and data and how to create that kind of startup. I have John Henry, and I have my good friend, Carrie Ann Nadeau uh, from Loop Insurance, uh, I believe co-CEOs, correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Yellow Book Road podcast. I'm I'm ecstatic. Looking forward forward to having this discussion. Thanks for having us. We're pumped about it. Glad we can make it happen. Yeah. I love the microphone too. Man, that voice. (laughs) Um, So... I always start off, uh, I want to allow you guys to have a little bit of an elevator pitch here. So for those that don't know either one of you and those that don't know Loop Insurance, Carrie Ann, ladies before gentlemen, who are you? Um, Why do we need to know and what is Loop Insurance? And then John, finish her sentence. Yeah, uh, and I'll pitch it over to John. So uh, Carrie Ann Nadeau, the co-founder and co-CEO at Loop. Uh, Nick and I have known each other for some time, so it's a Great privilege to be on the Yellow Road podcast and um, building the platform. I know your followers are fantastic, you know, really renegades and on the forefront of what's up and coming in insurance. So it's our privilege to be here and to speak to those folks. Um, It's been uh, some time since we last met since COVID. And uh, in that time, I have sort of like a superhero gone into the phone booth, changed clothes and come out as a new human. Um, I went into the phone booth of COVID as the founder of a company called Ometry that was measuring uh, the safety of roads for telematics enabled usage based car insurance companies and came out as the co-founder of Loop. And I'll pitch it over to John. Maybe John, you could give the elevator pitch for Loop. Yeah, I'll start first by introducing myself. Um, John, proud son of immigrants, um, just entrepreneur by DNA. Uh, I've been doing this for for some time, and I really have a love for conceiving things in my mind and building them. Started first with just like hustle type businesses, and then over time developed a little bit more of a macro view, more sophistication, took on bigger and bigger projects. I built uh, a non-for-profit incubator in Harlem, the first one. Then that expanded out to building a venture capital firm called Harlem Capital. Uh, We went out to raise good amount of capital backing women and minority owned companies. And, um, and now most recently here at loop uh, and at loop, we're, we're seeking to, um, we're effectively seeking to transform the auto insurance industry. I think that the auto insurance industry needs a whole lot more love than what, uh, than its current state. Um, and that means love for the customers, but that also means creating a more inclusive future of uh, private passenger auto. And for us, because of Carrie's background in predictive models and kind of developing risk analytics tools, we had unique insight into the current rate filings that other carriers um, operationalize. And I think a lot of the things that are in there don't treat people fairly. 
don't give them uh, an equitable uh, output in terms of a price, in terms of treatment, in terms of where they fall in the non-standard or standard or who, you know, the reality is who cares? There's people that drive safe that come from all different types of socioeconomic backgrounds and the industry's uh, inefficient pricing of these customers is the reason that we exist. We're going to build a big business in their blind spots and treat these same people that are underinsured and overlooked. Um, we're going to treat them, you know, like a VIP, price them fairly, and uh, build a multi-billion-dollar business as a result. Okay, so I love the concept. I have to ask you, uh, Carrie Ann was. Uh, data kind of fit. She grew up in Connecticut. So insurance is kind of in her DNA. Insurance wasn't in your DNA. I have <laughs> to imagine that you probably had particular stereotypes of insurance. So uh, given your background as an entrepreneur and, and, and creating a, a venture fund and all of that, what was the attractive element? What, what made you, you, you said bigger macro projects, what was it about this that attracted you enough that you said, okay, I need to be actively, not just invest, but I need to be actively a part of that? Mm, that's an excellent question. For me, I really view insurance uh, as a vehicle to deploy empathy at scale. Mm. This to me, you know, the root premise of insurance is to care deeply for people. And that's something that I was already doing through my numerous endeavors. And here I found a product that is complex and I love complex problems mm -hmm. because it keeps people out. Um, it requires tremendous operational capacity and grit. Another thing that keeps people out, but it also requires an ungodly amount of empathy and deep care for customers in order to successfully build brand. And in Carrie and I's union, what I saw was a very unique, not only product market fit, that's more often discussed, but what's less often discussed is founder product fit. Mm -hmm. I believe that with my brand development capabilities and with Carrie's technical capabilities, we have the double-headed monster <laughs> that is needed to succeed in this industry. Now, there are, this is a, this is not a blue ocean. This is a red ocean. It a is. lot of people raising money, blah, blah, yeah. blah. It looks crowded at the, at the onset. But, and I took a hard look at this. I said, man, do I want to go in this like, you know, very, very messy space where customer acquisition cost is so high and you hear all this stuff. But as I took a real, real close look, I started realizing that the majority of players in this space, their value proposition was price. Price, 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 right? Because they have this idea that the customer is super price sensitive and they, they may be and they are, but it's like, say 15%, say 20%, say 30% in seven minutes, you can do seven and six and five. I'm like, man, what about the people? <laughs> what if we built a people first insurance company that was powered by the community and the technology was serving into the mission of caring for people? And that seems simple. But in my assessment of the industry, it was lost on the current practitioners because a lot of them come from insurance. So they're thinking in terms of expected loss ratios and, you know, all the terms I've learned now that, you know, it, it's, it's fine to over index for that, but too much so, and you're not resonating with anybody. Yeah. Oh, completely. And, and, and yeah. And, th and yeah. that's why, well, I'll sprinkle this so we can touch on it later, but that over indexing on that stuff is the same reason why you have to clobber prospective customers with ad frequency. They don't care about your ads and you have to just deploy an ungodly amount of ad spend. And that's why you're converting at the price that you are. Have you ever tried leading with mission and seeing what that does for your distribution? Just a question mark. Yeah. So, so that gets into um, a really interesting, it's a debate, right? That's occurring. Avi and Sheffy from Coverger have a really instilled with me like just like how how difficult brand is to them there is no that insurance is not worthy of being a consumer first or consumer facing brand because the the only thing the only tactic that they have is price right so them it's just to them it's just like well you, that needs to be all abstracted away insurance should hang in the background you're trying to bring it into the foregrounds right? And bring this particular mission. Um, 
which is is going to be a challenge. So kind of flip it over to Carrie Ann, because this is where you came from when, you know, old ODN to a... Uh, <laughs> Ometry. 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 <laughs> I, was gonna, I, was thinking, I was thinking of an odometer. Ometry. Yeah. <laughs> we all struggle with the name on that. Oh, even my mom doesn't get it right. It's bad. Um, but I, I think I have a sense of where your question's going. And what strikes me about insurance and the people I've met over the many years that I've been in insurance is we are all really good at heart. We are very technically proficient financial service operators, but we're not in banking. We're in insurance and we're in insurance for a reason. And that's because we care about people and their lives and their livelihood. And it gives us purpose every day to show up to work and do that work well. Uh, we can be data minded nerds. Uh, all, shout out to all my like actuary friends out there. I have made a lot of really wonderfully academic and brilliant people in insurance, but the underlying thread and the consistent thing is that the reason they got an insurance was because they cared. And so I think we're actually not recreating insurance so much as revisiting what insurance was really about to begin with and bringing that historical sort of essence of why we all have insurance back to the front center of the conversation is that if our neighbor gets in trouble, we want to make sure that our neighbor and their family are able to continue uh, on with their daily lives and not be so devastated while we sit right next door in a wealth, right? If somebody is out of a car or can't buy their car insurance, they can't get to school, they can't get to work, they can't yeah. get to the grocery store. Yeah. I want to make sure they're back on the road because I care about them getting uh, back on their way and back well, on their journey. I wanna, so I want to just jump in here and maybe make this a little spicy. So Carrie just reverted back to our safe zone that we've, you know, discussed internally. Hey, let's make sure that we're not seen as a disruptor. We want, you know, we want to uh, be clear that we're building on top of the tradition that is insurance. So that's a safe zone because then insurance people are not off put, which is acceptable. However, one thing that I've noticed is that, you know, insurance is really just banking. Um, you know, your, your allocators of capital yep. and it's conservative capital. Uh, and so you select your risks. Um, and I think one of the things that have, you know, that have dawned on me in this process of securing reinsurance capacity, which is going well for us, thankfully, is that there are a lot of carriers, if we were just to zoom into this non-standard standard debate, that uh, uh, don't, that you can tell in their, in how they characterize people that might be in the non-standard bucket that there's stigma and judgment associated with how they view these folks. Uh, and so, you know, in my earlier days of getting clear on the differences, because everyone had a different sense of what is non-standard, what is standard, that seemed to be a moving goalpost of a definition. It's some esoteric categorization. And when, when I push, well, what does that mean? And you'll get lines like, oh, it's urban folks, or, you know, and they're really, what they're really saying is, hey, it's, you know, it's, uh, probably poor folks that, mm -hmm. you know, um, are in a less fortunate position found that has been alarming to me um, is that that asset class or that category of insurance is seen as a safe monetary bet because it's very fee rich. Okay. So you're, so it's a fee rich business. These folks are predictably and reliably in a vicious financial circle and you can bet that they're going to pay their fees. Um, uh, and it's minimum limits. So the, the reinsurer is off the hook. And so really who ends up losing here are the people that are in that category. Uh, we'll, we'll call them non-standard, although we don't subscribe to those terms personally. Um, but so there's, there is a hypocrisy a little bit. And I do think that carries right that these, that people care, but there's a big difference between caring on paper, but then also being connected to the lived experience that these same customers are going through. Right. And so we're speaking to folks that are completely removed, live in a very affluent zip code are doing well for themselves. And they say, you know, well, non-standard's a good business, you know, especially during COVID. And so it's, it's, it's dawning on me here that there's a lot of profiteering going on um, of vulnerable populations, and there doesn't seem to be any incentive to fundamentally reassess the uh, inputs that are creating these outputs 
because they're making profits. So if you're making profits and, and you're incentivized and you're making money off of the flow anyway, um, then you're not incentivized to deliver uh, the uh, uh, claim uh, claims in, in a quick manner with the exception of potentially being connected to customer satisfaction. But that aside, um, there are all kinds of broken elements of this industry that um, Carrie, whom was an insure tech founder and you know is well respected in the community, is careful to tread this line. But I think I have a, probably a little bit more license to just you know point this out. Much in the same way, by the way, when I was in venture capital and I saw a lot of um, traditional venture firms maybe. Uh, have these soft words for, for founders and say, well, they're untraditional or they're outside of the box. And it's like, what does that actually mean? Yeah. And so I think that we have, we should be comfortable having these very explicit conversations and putting a finger on it. Yeah. Yeah. I would actually add to that, John. I think both things can be true at the same time is that unfortunately people's bias is not only lingered in their opinions about decision-making and their interest in changing the status quo, it's also been unfortunately encoded and entrenched in rate filings. So we see the continued use of credit score. We see the continued use of educational attainment, whether if you have a high school education, you pay more than someone with a college degree. If you went to Harvard, you get an extra discount. All of these ways in which our understanding of who is a good risk have been actually encoded in rate filings makes it even more difficult for people that do want to con confront the structural bias or their own personal bias to actually confront the structural bias that's built into the insurance product that they sell. And so I do think that people have a lot of conflict in their hearts right now around how can I continue to be involved in an industry that's perpetuating a, a product that is very clearly disadvantaging or disproportionately discriminating some groups. Regulators are on top of this. State governors are regulating credit out of auto insurance pricing. It's been an ongoing dialogue and in insurance for a very long time. It's just that it is baked in in a lot of different companies. And I think a lot of people feel a certain helplessness around their ability to escape that rule structure. Um, because people in insurance, while they are good people, are also risk averse people. There are also people who like to make very calculated, informed decisions. And going out on a limb doesn't come supernaturally to no. those at any tier, let alone those at a lower tier who are trying to convince leadership of to do the right thing. And so I think both things can be true. That, Nick, is what drove us to start our own MGA these precise conversations that we're having now that we frankly have not had on any other public facing platform. So I think you did create this safe space with your note up top that just, you know, Hey, take it yep. there. Um, well, I, I understand the spiciness of it. I understand because I've in some ways I've gone through the same thing in my MGA space, which is on the natural catastrophe side on the flood side. Um, I didn't see the um, more of the, I think, really the discriminate this the discriminatory piece. It was just more of the uh, what Carrie Ann described. It was more of the baked in legacy related. Like this is kind of how we do things, right? Like top from top to bottom. It was this is the way we've always done it, and there just was not any. Um, impetus to kind of change that and I was just like but it doesn't make any sense from what I saw and you're kind of running into the same thing so let's let's let the audience kind of understand how you're going about doing that um I don't I to me auto is um a particular market with that's rich in claims data and other things that I I know Carrie Ann's uh, methodology here, I but I actually don't understand the meat and potatoes of it. So talk about how you can break down those walls and kind of reduce some of these biases and and, and frankly just create um, value propositions for those people that are non-standard. How how what is what is the background that you're going to go about doing that so you can secure that mission? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll start and then, and then carry sure. can dig into some of the technical piece. So, so just from, uh, from Carrie, can you go on mute? I think I'm good. So just from an alignment perspective up top. So one, we don't, we're, we're a 
standard book of business, um, but we don't really see our customers as not standard or standard. And we can get into that in a moment. We're getting, a, we're getting rid of some key demographic factors and more so basing our rating based on where and how you drive. Some of which sounds novel, some of which, uh, some of which uh, is not novel, some of which is very novel. But, but to answer your question about how, the, to start it from the business perspective, the most important decision that we made was to take this core technology and package it in an MGA. And it was a very key decision for us, but it was not an easy one. Right. You know, you're, you're, you're fighting this battle. Yeah. It's a tough decision. Yep. You have to secure a fronting carrier, reinsuring comp capacity. You have to, uh, you have to get capitalized to go out to the market. You have to get approved. Like there, there's all kinds of daunting elements to this that we considered the pains, but to us, the gains that we stood, not even just from a monetary perspective, but even from the perspective of furthering the mission, we felt like at the end of the day, we were the best stewards of our own technology and our own mission, and that it would be best expressed by vertically integrating and going direct to consumer. We would best preserve the tone, the messaging, and also the technology. So that was kind of the, the key decision and pivot point from when Ametri was dissolved and reemerged as Loop. Um, and we've done some very, very key things to the rate filings that um, Carrie would, I'm sure, be glad to discuss. Yeah, happy to. So in car insurance, what you really care about is people filing claims. So people being involved in a car crash. You don't care if they're going to pay back their bills, if their credit score is high and they're you know going to pay back their bills. You don't care if they have degrees hanging on the wall. You care about the thing that's going to cost the business money, which is a claim. Right. And so what we're doing is taking a fresh look at what causes car crashes. And if we can be more accurate in predicting and anticipating who's likely to be involved in a crash, then we are going to have a significant arbitrage opportunity on price without over discounting risk. We are going to move towards the risk actually matching the rate for individuals and a much more personalized automobile insurance price at renewal. So how the meat and potatoes works is we look at what causes crashes first. We look at your driving behaviors. As John mentioned, telematics is sort of using a phone application to see whether you're speeding or hard braking or distracted driving by talking on your cell phone. That stuff's not new, but how we use that information, we gather all of that information. We also bring together the context. So where are you driving? Are you driving on the 5% of all roads that have traffic crashes each month? Is your daily commute or is your high school student's daily commute always on one of those roads? Okay, that also matters. I can also interact those two things. So now I can see, are you heartbreaking because maybe a kid ran out in front of your car in a school zone? Are you heartbreaking in an intersection that has a lot of fender benders and is likely a behavior that I can say is signal for you potentially being involved in a crash, much more predictive of a crash. The third kind of component is that we didn't throw the baby out with the bathwater in building our rate filing. We looked at the historical factors that insurance carriers have used. There's actuarial justification going back hundreds of years for a lot of these factors, but we critically evaluated each one independently, line by line. We found some crazy shit, to be quite honest with you, that insurance carriers have buried in their rate filings. A carrier that is very well known uh, that recently IPO'd that let people commit uh, vehicular homicide without penalizing those drivers or charging them more. Uh, you could literally have a hit and run and it was the equivalent of a speeding ticket in their rate filing approved. Um, you, But we looked at more common things as well, like your education, your occupation. And we decided that these things were not good predictors of crash risk, that we could be much more accurate if we replace them with more uh, measurements of how you drive, where you drive, and those two functions interacted. Um, so in, in loops filing, we are getting rid of, and it will not appear, your educational attainment, your occupation, your credit score, your home ownership status, um, and other factors that we just felt like didn't make sense when it came to measuring crashes and didn't further our mission for the risk to match the rate. These are old proxy rating criteria that people thought 
would work or it was the data that was available to them 30 years ago. But guess what? There's a lot more data, a lot better technology, yep. a lot more accurate information and a lot more dynamic information, which I think is very important in this exact moment that we're in. The fact that we can tell when roads are becoming more dangerous means that we can advise our customers and help them better manage their own risk as they're taking back to the road during COVID-19. We don't need to wait six months and realize, oh my goodness, look at all these traffic crash fatalities. We were singing this song back in June and July before carriers started to realize how it would affect their book of business. We're watching how the trend is changing in advance to enable and empower our customers to make good decisions for themselves um, and keep the performance of our book of business healthy over time. At the end, it also does benefit us when our customers aren't involved in crashes. But I think most importantly, it keeps our customers on the road and on their way to wherever they're going. I, I think that's a very interesting aspect because as you were going through, I knew um, from having worked with you um, or talked to you in the past about you know, your big push on, hey, there are just some roads that are just more dangerous than others. And a lot of, a lot of your, um, cr uh, your automobile risk is really what roads you drive on, right? And so it's an interesting aspect because um, what, I, what I have always sort of disliked around the telematics space is that one, I thought th this is clearly Lake Wobegon effect. Most people think they're good drivers. I would say most people are really terrible drivers, right? So they're, that pool of good drivers is actually really small. And mm -hmm. to just go after them is- I agree. You know, but, and I have no problem instituting telematics, but they, they always kind of touted like, oh, we're gonna be able to give you, this, there's gonna be touch points. And the touch point that I always thought like, if you're going to be texting me or notifying me on my phone and telling me that I'm breaking too hard, I'm gonna shut that off. Like after a while, it's like, I'm, I don't wanna listen to that. That's like mom or dad telling me how to drive, but yours is different. Yours is like more of watch out for these roads, right? Like this is the routes that you are taking and you can actually guide some, uh, someone that, um, you, you can, you have the potential ability to kind of mold them or uh, change their commuting patterns in such a way to make them a better driver. By telling them they're hard braking, that's kind of like a parent, but telling them like, you might want to avoid, um, there's one intersection in route one north of Boston that's like oh, one of the most horrible spots where you have to go from zero to 60 in like, 30 feet in order yep. to get onto the highway. Like you're telling them there's a way around that. And if you avoid this, like this, these are ways that you can avoid accident. And that to John, to your branding element, those are touch points that auto insurers just don't have. I don't yep. want, I don't want the touch points to be when you send me the bill, when you send me the renewal or to tell me I'm breaking too hard, but tell or me, when there's giving, an accident and yeah. you're being booted or whatever, um, but telling I, me, telling me like how to, um, where I can improve my commuting or to avoid these roads uh, or a parent with a teenage child, like those seem like more of the touch points that I think make the insurer um, more valuable in, in that, like that's truly showing you care, I think. 100%. You literally just dissected our uh, value proposition very eloquently and um the crux of our vision and i think we can expand upon that even further i think the existing telematic solutions will not work and have not really they worked have not. and caught on yeah. because of what you just mentioned every touch point is negative you're doing this wrong you're hard braking you're speeding you, you it turns and you psychographically feel yelled at yep. so you turn it off and it's yep. not worth the potential savings but now communicating we believe at loop that those are but the inputs we use so so here's what the telemax industry got wrong but but or i'm sorry here's what the telemax industry got right and that is those are many of the correct data points indeed 
but those are but the inputs. The output yeah. needs to be rooted in the consumer's experience. Yeah. And now when now what we have that augments our ability to be valuable is the contextualization of the roads themselves. So now we can say to your point, hey, um, you know, these roads are dangerous. But that's still to me kind of a scary wag. What happens when you say, hey, Friday from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m., you might just want to stay home and you can save if you do so because we know that that is a dangerous stretch. Or, hey, Saturday from 11 p.m. to 2 a.m., this is, you know, this is a dangerous stretch here. Be aware because we know that there's a lot of drunk driving coming out of this bar here on this particular road, right? But now let's expand upon that value prop safe road safety insights it's is but one of the things that we can do hey nick on your way home here's a local car wash 100 percent of proceeds go to your local softball team right when you move through time and space with your customer and your community you have a unique ability to activate the offline reality that is your community which is what you really care about right and that's what we care about, we're insuring the community. So how can insurers show up for the same communities that we're insuring yeah. in a very real way? So now we're starting to get it in. Now we're talking some like soft bank, like we're going to make, like we're going to raise a hundred well, million dollars type of stuff because it's, it's a very complex, uh, uh value prop. That's just, yeah. It, it can get metaphysical here yes. in a, in a way where, um, cause I hadn't thought of that angle. Right. So now it's you, it, Carrie Ann and I actually touched on this before we hit record, which is you can abstract the insurance. Like there, there's potentially a way to bring better economics to your community by allowing others act, you know, that, that ability to, hey, there's a pizza shop here. Like it's five o'clock, you might be hungry. Right. There's a pizza shop here type of thing in a way where you can promote safe driving, but also be a bigger part of that driver's experience. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> Boom. And, and Carrie, before you jump in there. So, so, so insurance is the thing you care literally the least about the least. Exactly. So exactly. You, so, so, so I, you, you use insurance <laughs> so that you can go do what you love to do, what you want to do. You can go see the friends that you need to see, go run the errands that you need to run. Go do what you want to do. And so how selfish is it? Think about the, self, the self-centered nature of the current insurance marketing ethos. You put yourself into their life. You're asserting dominance and putting yourself into someone's life with just this frequency of TV ads versus saying, hey, in a way, you know, we move you. We're here to move you, right? We want yeah. to just be a driver's companion tool and, wow. and oh. be there for you on your journey. We're getting there together. I'm writing and this down. That, that is like a significant tagline, a driver's companion tool, because that's what it is. That's like an abstracted element of it where um, you can begin to change what insurance is here. It's, some, it's something else. The, the, it's the monetization vehicle of this thing but it's like how you know we chat or something else brings all b- bundles yeah. all of these different experiences <laughs> coming in uh that is uh that i'm is gonna very, send this clip to clever. masayoshi son at softbank <laughs> and <laughs> and i'm gonna blow your mind from a data side because the amount and volume of information that we're getting is in an interesting way puts us at the forefront of the conversation about what big data and AI can be meaningfully for consumers in the next era of innovation. Because the companies that hold information about the location of their customers, the behaviors of their customers, the destinations, the safety, the time of day that they leave, where they go, whether they take their kids to soccer practice or whether they go to the hospital at two o'clock in the morning is a powerful amount of information to understand the reality of a person. You are literally in the car with them. If I wanted to, I could reconstruct and sit in the passenger seat of your car and on Google Earth, take the same routes you take every day. What that empowers me to do is actually build products that actually are 
quantifiably relevant to your life, right? Are you a person that likes Starbucks and stops at Burger King and takes their kid to school every single day and um, goes to soccer practice afterwards and then maybe goes to a movie? I start to develop a really deep understanding of who you are and I can build products that are specifically yes. personalized to your experience. So no longer is it a one size fits all auto insurance policy. It's a, hey, this is a policy that makes sense for you because we notice that you are a gig economy worker who likes to pick up jobs just on the weekends during hours that are really safe to drive. Here's a reasonably priced insurance policy that makes sense for your life. And that's sort of the direction that uh, we're headed at Loop. That, that is not too dissimilar, right? You could make the same connection to, that's what Amazon did in retail, right? Same thing. And this would be information that Amazon can't get. This is information that Facebook Correct. can't get. Like, and to your point, Carrie Ann, this is relevant information, especially since what the internet has struggled to conquer is the local community, the local retail, the local commerce element. Amazon and these other companies have done it at a, at a grand scale, right? But it's always that last mile thing that like now you're seeing like the door dashes of the world that are starting to try to figure out how do we economically do that last mile thing. This is the last mile thing. This is, Yeah, it's you know, even bigger than the last mile thing because it's empowering individuals to achieve their greatest economic, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an economic empowerment tool. If you give somebody keys to a car, that you empower them to move, you give them physical mobility, they can get to all of the things that they want to do in their lives actually through that physical mobility channel. But it also, as John mentioned, is a community economic empowerment tool as yeah. well, because you can be there to connect people that otherwise wouldn't make connections people to businesses, support local businesses. This is not just like a, hey, we're going to sponsor the local little league team. This is, we're a part of your community and helping to make those connections and deepen the bonds with where you are and where you go so that you get to know your neighbors, so that you care for one another and think about insurance as that product, which it is, right? It, at its core is everybody pooling resources to take care of you if something goes wrong might as well situate it in the community again. Every so often, um, if people have noticed this on my podcast, this is one of the benefits of doing something like this is every so often um, I, that light bulb goes off in my head. Like I'm, I'm thinking I'm going into something with an idea, mm -hmm. with a, a prejudice of what it is, sure. you know, because of my experience. And then all of a sudden it is, I, I figure out that insurance has become a driver's companion tool <laughs> and my mind just like explodes. Cause I'm just like, holy crap, this is a whole new way of kind of viewing this. And it's, um, that's why I love having conversations with people like you, Carrie Ann and John is that different perspective that you can come in because it's not necessarily insurance, Carrie Ann, to your point. Um, is bad people. That's not what sure. happened here. It's more about a legacy, you know, 100 plus year old of this is kind of how we did things and people inheriting businesses over time. And hey, we just got to kind of, we got to increase by 10% here and 10% there. How do we do that? And people go ahead and do their jobs. And um, no one would, no one could say that insurance execs have creativity. Like that's not, like we have to import that, right? And that's what, that's what this is. This is like people from outside the industry coming in. And uh, I could just imagine you guys, what, what, is, what is a whiteboarding collaborative session look like with the whole loop team? <laughs> What's that look uh, like? It looks like a lot of fun, um, but sometimes a lot of like, uh, just like passionate disagreement about, um, you know, there, there's a polarity that exists between the human centered side and the more quantified side of the business. Because at the end of the day, you let me run with it. We'll create a giant fluff machine that loves everyone yeah. into perpetuity. But, yeah. uh, but Carrie Ann's you know. going to say, no, 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 no. Uh, but no, but the, we, number, we have, the numbers have to add up. 100%. We, we got to hit our loss ratio performance numbers. Yeah. We, we have to, uh, you know, 
have a tight grip on claims handling efficiencies, but you know, they don't come at expense of one another. However, in ideation, sometimes um, each of us in our respective disciplines can be jaded by our experience and say, okay, no, you know, it's done this way. It's done that way. But I think we get through, we get to breakthroughs when we can think from a principle over precedent type of mindset where we say, okay, if nothing was a, was an obstacle, right. If we didn't have to worry for this particular moment, how the numbers would work or how we would execute that from a go to market perspective, what would be the ideal scenario? And then we okay. work backwards from there. So that's interesting because I think InsureTech 1.0 was exactly what you just described, John, except it was technologists who came into the insurance sphere and they were just like, we're going to start from ground up principles, mm -hmm. but they did it from a technology side. They kind of viewed this as like, oh, there's too much friction. We're going to get this digitized and doing Correct. this. Uh, and, and I had this conversation with someone recently where I said, I think InsureTech 2.0 is going to be marketing people, um, other data people, not pure technologists, people who can come in with a different angle and not just say we need to reduce friction, yep. but to think about how the dots connect, the, how, what the mission potentially is. But I think even grander thinking about how can we turn insurance into a driver's companion tool. <laughs> I, well, I a technologist that... isn't going to do that. A technologist is going to be thinking about the stack and like the website sure. and we're going to, you know, it's going to look pretty and it's going to be easy, yeah. which is extremely important. Yeah. But, but it's only that, half the story, right? But it's still and... insurance. Yeah. If I, if I may, a technologist kind of comes to the table and looks at the tools that are sitting on the table and asks, how do I build something most efficiently and most effectively? A creatively minded sort of brand developer, like doesn't start at the table. They like do a handstand or a cartwheel in the front yard, right? They're yeah. thinking about being in the real world. They're not at the, they're not looking for operational efficiencies within the constraints of the resources that they currently have. They're saying, how do I look at this box differently and ideate about what a consumer would enjoy? How do they yeah. feel? And John sort of touched on this polarity. I think it's true to our business, but it's true to insurance in general, that there's this push and this pull between very fast decision-making uh, for the consumer benefit, right? This like marketing ethos that says like, put it into the world, test it, see if they like it, We'll get data back immediately, we'll refine, we'll rejigger, we'll adjust, we'll learn from the market dynamically. And then a more logic-based thinking that says, okay, let's think six steps ahead. If this, then that, then this other thing. We move a little bit slower, we're a little bit more methodical, mm -hmm. we're a little bit more organized, a little bit more intentional about decision-making. And this, these two things you have to be great at to be great in insurance. You have to be able to connect to the customers, make decisions quickly, understand and receive feedback from your customer, but also be able to translate that into diligent underwriting and a structure of, yeah. an, of a business that um, allows you to stay afloat. Is, isn't just yeah. a, a, a short term strategy for a lot of customers very quickly. Anybody can do that by discounting their price like crazy. Yeah. Where, where you get good is if you can have both. And John talked about it as like a push and a pull. I actually think it's, if I may use an analogy, taking the best from each and bringing them together and letting some of the worst of each, you know, making it too slow because we want to be certain in our decision is, is a negative. It could be a negative if you take it too far for the quantitatively minded person and moving too fast and being reckless yeah, and it's a drag not following on. the law can be negative. So it's a drag it's really on each side. Finding the positives and bringing um, them I want together. to jump in here and just touch on Nick's point because I think it was a very astute one. We talk about it a lot as well, where 1.0 of insure techs completely did indeed revolve around the modernization of the distribution. Um, because you're tempted to think from the outside in that that is the biggest source of friction, that if you just made it such that you could 
you know, receive your quote online, that that would significantly enhance the experience. Um, I think that there were a lot of unicorns that came from that. Esurance was probably the original one, but there are a number of others that were sure. still, e even Metro Mile was probably 1.5 where where it was the early era of telematics they were probably the first one to you know build a big business out of doing it but i think what web or what intertech 2.0 is now able to see is that you can't sprinkle a dig you can't sprinkle delight on top of a system that has uh to your guys earlier point a lot of legacy uh built into the actual models and so the unique blend here of what we're doing is that we can build on top of the telematics experience and the digital, but you have to also innovate on the actual rate filing side of the business because otherwise you're just putting makeup on a pig, so to speak. Yeah. You know, there, there's only so much that you can control the actual, uh, uh, you know, there's only such a, you can only uh, generate, you know, uh, uh, X per, you know, your, your website can only become X percent more sleek or fast or what have you, but ultimately you run into the root of the issue. Well, it'd be, so I, I think some of these InsureTech 1.0s have done some neat things, but at the end of the day, it's still insurance, right? And I think that is the frustration because nobody wants to buy insurance. Nobody gets excited about buying insurance. And I think that's where like Avi and Sheffy from Coverager were coming from in terms of a client facing brand is that if all you got is insurance, nobody wants that. So you don't deserve to be a client facing brand. And, and they, have, they have been speaking for a considerable period of time about the abstraction, right? I don't, they don't use those words, but it's just like insurance has to be part of something else. Right, and that's something else. Now you can talk about experiences. Now you can talk about being a client-facing brand because it's something the client actually wants to interact with, versus something they're forced to buy or you know someone's twisting their arm or guilting them in, which is very interesting to your model. So, um, not to play fanboy here, but I'll, I'll kind of step step out because I'm now thinking about like will where could this go? And this leads to the potential for you using this marketing in your technology to have some sort of um, expanded relationship. So, so, you know, as an MGA, uh, uh, mine as well, you always start at policy zero. If you haven't sold anything, that first policy is policy one, but there's an opportunity given all of the, um, I guess the, the legacy friction, John, that you just talked about, the legacy friction, there's an opportunity for you to potentially bring this to the mass auto market, right? Something that the legacy companies might be able to sink their teeth into. Have you thought 100%, about that? 100%. And that's what Carrie's first business tried to do. And so in all fairness, they had their chance. <laughs> you know, Carrie, I saw firsthand was banging down doors of many, many carriers in attempts to sell this technology but what happens in the b2b sector of this industry is that uh a lot of you know b2b has a tough time in this industry because you have to rely upon the adoption rate and speed of a much larger company that's not terribly incentivized to go with you anyhow and so there's a lot of great technology that just dies a slow death as a result of not even their product not having product market fit it's just middle management and people feeling like they can't make those decisions or in some cases not being able to pull the trigger. And in some cases, like in the case of this, when you're seeking to change the actual rate filing and the architecture of the insurance product, good luck with that friction yeah. to get these companies to refile. So, um, well, that's, so, that's, the, that's the point that I was getting to is like for, for, for a traditional insurer, right? And I'll just, I, I, uh, let's take the biggest one, State Farm, right? For them, that's the Titanic. They can't like they can't move. They're stuck in in a very traditional way. But there's you know why should they be stuck in the legacy stuff? You're almost bringing like a complete a newer solution to the rate filing 
and all of and all of that stuff. So now let's dissect that a little bit, right? So you have the largest slows players that likely will not move anytime soon. You have large players that are tech forward, like progressive, and have the capacity and capability to build some of these tools in house over time, and that's likely. Um, but they'll they're likely going to keep the goods in house. You have on the opposite end of the spectrum much smaller tech-enabled MGAs that are willing indeed to adopt this technology and active and actively so, um, but they don't have a whole lot of market share anyway. So it's a, a small total addressable opportunity. So what we s- sought out, s- sought to do with Loop and are doing is effectively building our own reference customer mm-hmm. and proving that a data-driven model of pricing insurance um, can work from a loss ratio perspective, which is at the end of the day, as we had established prior, 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 and prior, is what this business is about. And when we do that, we will, to your point, Nick, have the distinguished opportunity to license this criteria, much in the way that FICO has packaged their model and they ship, you know, they don't, they don't sell the goods, but they'll ship you a score that you can rely upon. And then, you know, it gets baked into the rate filing and that becomes a new norm. And then in 30, 40, 50 years, someone will come and say, wow, that thing that loop did is so, you know, prejudiced because, because they, you know, or yeah, it's antiquated yeah. because they use, you know, a territory rate factor in reality. Now we can measure the nanosecond down to whatever. Yeah. But, but I think that, you know, firstly, it's just incredible the amount of astute observations that you've made because it's almost like you've been in our head the last year as we have these internal discussions about what the future of the industry and loop looks like. And you were able to touch on a number of the areas that we personally find fascinating, like the driver's companion tool, something we use a lot, but also the ability to potentially, if we get it right, if we get it right, this whole industry changes. If we don't, fine. But if we get it right, substantially so we will be copied in other people's rate filings yeah 100 yeah um and that's just from the insurance ops innovation side that's not even to address if we get it right from the brand and marketing side you're gonna see you're gonna start to see uh liberty mutual jingles you know talking about like using, caring using for the customer using loop rates <laughs> right we use loop rates not to mention well i don't want to give away too much goods but I'll just say this. Our legal entity name is Loop Mobility Incorporated. Okay. We're a mobility company. Our purpose, our stated purpose in our brand essence is we move people. Now, when you look at it from that perspective, can we, it, you know, we're an MGA, but we're really a data product at our core. Mm-hmm. What type of integrations can we develop? with automotive partners and with other routing software providers? Um, can we embed ourselves into the very fabric that is movement and ensure you end to end across your whole journey? You know, that's when we get into our uh, ha type of, you know, uh, <laughs> discussions that Carrie uh, likes to, to riff on. But yeah, this is, oh, this is so much fun. I have to say. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, when I do these, I'm always thinking about like, okay, how am I going to layer the copy to get people interested? And I'll, I'll, I'll end with this story and carry and let you um, get, get a last word in as well. Um, I remember before InsureTech was even a word, I was at a conference and Metro Mile was there and I'm just scratching my head about UBI because immediately I'm just like, I just don't want, I want the information, but I don't want to be lectured on how I'm driving. And I just didn't see the market potential. And, you know, and the CEO got up and he talked about how, well, you know, we can plug this in and we can tell you if you need an oil change. And I'm like, okay, that's a start. But you can see like on this particular podcast, like my head gets blown because it's like, wow, okay, this is not just telling me about my, I need an oil change. Like this is, this is a significant customer experience type of relationship that I've been wanting someone to come into insurance and like deliver, but haven't seen it. So carry on, 
take us home. Yeah, absolutely. I think we have at Loop a really powerful opportunity and privilege to reset the dialogue about how people interact with their insurance companies, how people think about their insurance companies, and importantly, I think as well for those in the insurance industry, what it feels like to be a part of the insurance industry. I don't want to go to a Christmas party uh, and ask you know, and be the person that nobody wants to talk to because I'm in insurance. I'm tired of insurance isn't a sexy industry. Insurance should feel like a rewarding career and a rewarding opportunity for all of us to be a better member of our community and support others on their journey. So I think we have a really big opportunity from across uh, across the spectrum here, but I'm really excited about um, what we know we can build, what we're going to execute in the next year, and then beyond that, we'll uh, we'll let the moment speak to us on which direction we end up taking the company into. But um, I think yeah. there's a lot of bright future ahead on That's this road. Awesome way to end this. Um, you're right. It should be a rewarding career, and if you do it the way that you all are doing it, it can be. So. Mm -hmm. John, Carrie Ann, thank you so much. Thanks for having us on the Yellow Book podcast. Um, really, <laughs> Just really, another episode. <laughs> appreciate really it. A, a great <laughs> format, 100%. Yeah, thank we you. had a lot of fun. Thank you. Appreciate it.